Hello again, everybody. We're back with Judge Tom Frawley talking about the law of divorce as well as uh, his experiences as a veteran practitioner in the area of domestic relations and, of course, his experience most recently on the bench where he was recognized, if I may say, as an expert in domestic relations law throughout the state of Missouri. And one of those reasons that he was sent out by the Supreme Court to cover divorce cases in other jurisdictions than his home jurisdiction was because he was and is so well respected. He's uh, written articles on the subject as well. So Tom, thanks for being with us again. We appreciate it. My pleasure. As Kevin said, uh, as one of his observations from uh, our first session on this topic, he didn't realize that there was so much complexity in this area, uh, especially as it related to all the issues regarding non-marital property and how it can be converted and things of that nature. So we look forward to your wisdom and your wit and some stories as well. Today we're going to principally focus on child custody issues in the context of divorce and maybe pick up a few issues that we didn't cover the last time. First of all, Tom, let's talk about uh, your views about people who are gay and lesbian or uh, maybe going through a sex change operation and come before you as a judge in a divorce case, what impact, if any, does that have on you? Um, basically none. I said it uh, in a positive way, not in a negative way. Um, if, if it's a gay couple um, and they've adopted a child um, or uh, one of the if they're women, one of the two women, or both women, have had a child, um, the question still comes down to one thing, what's in the best interest of the, of the, uh, of the um, children? Um, prior to the recognition by the Supreme Court of gay marriage, um, people weren't, they weren't married, of course, so they were just living together, so what you had was a paternity case or a custody case it was kind of an animal that really didn't fit um, any of the statutes. So um, the question was, uh, from the lawyer's standpoint, what do they, what do they, what do they label it? And um, because uh, of most of the women were, um, uh, was their egg but a sperm donor, and if it was uh, two, two guys, it might have been their sperm and an egg donor. So you didn't have the other side of the of the actual paternity of the child involved. And of course you would have in a normal paternity case, it would be dad and mom fighting out who gets custody. So you had to figure out how you're gonna handle it. And um, I just looked at it as two people who were living together and they had a child. Um, uh, but it it's got its own complexity to it in that if each of the women, have, have, if there's two children and each woman is a birth mom and the other, lady is not a birth mom, should the birth mom have priority, if you will, legally, over the non-birth parent? So you've got that complexity to it. And similarly with two, two men, if they're both, if there's two children and they're both um, a sperm donor to each child, you've got the similar problem. So it's got its own complexity to it. But the, for, for me, the gay lesbian issue was just a it just was not a component uh, that that was their their view of themselves, and that's their right and their privilege. I just dealt with it as as um, as need be. We had I did have one where we had a, uh, a, a it was a paternity case, meaning it was a dad and a mom, and the dad and the child I think was probably ten or eleven was now uh, wasn't he was having issues with his own sexuality, and we concluded he was. Uh, really a woman and was going through the, um, the, the precursor to the actual surgery. And we, we filed for custody of his child and appointed a guardian of light, as you do in many custody cases. And the guardian met with the child and we tried the case and I gave custody to the dad, um, notwithstanding his, his issues because he was the better parent. Did he have a request of you in that case? Yeah, he did. Um, uh, he asked, he, after I gave him custody of the child, he, he asked me if I would 
put in my order that the child could call him mom. And I said, you know, I think that's between you and the, you and your child, um, you and your and um, uh, and so um, and I asked the guard. I probably asked the guardian why him was uh, was somebody I re truly respect. And he said, I've met with the child. We didn't really discuss that issue, but the child the child has no problem. He understands who his dad is. That's his dad. And they'll, the, the child will figure out he doesn't need the direction from you, Judge. Perfect. So off they went. And um, as I may have told this audience, or Kevin and you in one of my prior appearances, um, Sometimes we, we learn the hard way, and sometimes it's the kids that do the best teaching. I was in it was a juvenile case, and I was talking to the young lady who was in care, and it was toward the end of her senior year in high school, and I said, uh, so what's the name of the guy that's taking you to prom? And she says to me, what makes you think it has to be a guy? And I said, thank you. Thank you very much. Why did you thank her? Because I needed to be educated, because um, I didn't get it. that you know, the world's different, and we should be sensitive in the way we frame our questions to the world that these young people and older people live in. And I said, "So, are you? Is anybody going with you to the prom? Are you taking anybody?" She said, "Yes, I'm taking. I don't remember what her name was." I said, "Great, have a good time." So yeah, it's. Well said. Um, it was. Uh, it was a. Uh, that's got to be 15 years ago, and I remember like it happened yesterday. So it's one of those things that has an impact. But the, the gay lesbian piece is, um, is just not to me. It does. It's not a determinative. Uh, not a determiner of anything for me. Tom, there was one story that I wanted to cover last time, but we didn't have time, and that has to do with the North Broadway property and a division of property issue. Mm -hmm. Tell us um, about that. Yeah, it, one of the things that, that, that you need to be careful of, and, and you can't be too cute, and it gets back to the adage of don't uh, pigs get fed and hogs get slaughtered, is that um, if you overvalue certain things on the expectation that your spouse is going to get it, and you undervalue certain things based on the expectation you're going to get it, um, you're playing with fire. So I had a case where these couple had very little. They had two, they really had nothing. They had Two cars, that was not an issue, and, and a house. A house was the issue. The house was up in North Broadway in the city of St. Louis. It was in between two truck depots. I never knew there was a house up there, but there apparently is, or what at least was. Um, and the husband valued the property at $10,000. He also valued all of his wife's clothes at $10,000. Um, and so he testified first and he said, I, I want the house and she can have all of her clothes. Okay. So wife gets on the stand and about probably 10 minutes in, I say to her, ma'am, can I ask you a question? She said, sure. Which do you want? Do you want your clothes or the house? She says, I want the house. Okay, that'll be the order. Sir, she gets the house, you get all of her clothes. But I don't want her clothes. I understand you don't want her clothes. You shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have been cute with the values of things. Now, whether she spent 10 grand in the clothes to buy them, they're not worth 10 grand on the, on the, on the resale market. So you got them all. And so it's just, um, you gotta be, you gotta be honest with the court when you value things and with what you ask for. Otherwise, you could end up with your spouse's clothes. A good lesson, no doubt. I remember a case that you told me about in which there was money in a bank account, about $8,000, that hadn't been spent going into the trial of the case. Do you recall that? No. <laughs> she went out, she had $8,000 that she had not spent. It came from a PDL oh, order. Oh, 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 okay, okay. What, yeah, I, I had a wonderful her? client, okay. One of, the, oh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite clients in the whole world. She was. She had been married a long time, and her husband had a very good job, um, made a good amount of money, but he was very tight with giving her money while they were married and while they were raising kids. And so she was very frugal. So <clears throat> we're getting divorced, and 
um, she needed some money per month to take care of herself. The kids were grown by then. And um, this is late 70s, early 80s. Uh, maybe, no, probably low, no, I'm sorry, probably late 80s. Because I, I, she came to my swearing in as a judge, which was really a wonderful thing. But she was just a wonderful lady. And so I think I got her maybe $4,000 a month. <clears throat> he was making at that time probably 120, 150 a year. So this is about eight months later or so, we're getting ready to go try the divorce because we can't, can't settle it. And so she comes into my office and we go back through her property statement to update the values of things. And I said, okay, the house, and we go through the cars. And okay, but bank, you still got the bank account? Yes, I do. How much is in it? Because at the time we did the first one, maybe, I don't know, 100 bucks. She got about $8,000. Her name was Ruth. I said, Ruth. Eight, where did you get $8,000? What's the money I was getting from my husband? I, I just didn't know how to spend it. I said, well, you need to go spend it. She said, well, what should I do? I said, I, I don't know, but you need to go spend it on, on anything. Why she did said, you say that? Because, I, because it was her money and that she, my view was she'd earned it through all the years she put up with this guy who <coughs> was impossible. And she deserved to spend it on herself. So she went out and bought a make coat. Okay, and so. Were you also so, worried that that might diminish your claim for? Uh, yeah, I was, but you know what? I wasn't worried about it in that case because she was such a nice lady and she would explain it exactly the way she presented to me. I just didn't know what, I didn't know how to spend it. I just hadn't, it, it was, uh, it was all the product of his control of her and it was just further example of basically what our theory was, was that he'd been just a controlling jerk and that she needed to have maybe more money than you would think based on the way they had lived. I said, so we get to trial, I said, did you spend it? Yeah. What did you do? I spent I bought a main coat, is that okay? Ruth, it's fine, <laughs> it's absolutely fine. And now, she, we did quite well with the judge. I wanted to follow up on one good, piece. Good people get, they get, they, cause she was honest, she went in. And the lawyer said, what'd you do with this? I went and bought a main coat. Well, you went and bought a main coat. Yes, sir, I've never had one during, I've never had anything for myself during the entire marriage. Thank you very much. It's as good as it gets. That's when you wade in in cross-examination and you shouldn't. Right, right. And she was, because she was just honest. It was just her. It wasn't, they spent it to be cute or to be funny or anything. She's never had anything like this in my home, whole life. Right. Never ask a question you don't know the answer to, unless the answer can't hurt you. <clears throat> Uh, Tom, d uh, during your recitation of that particular case, you mentioned money received before the case is decided. Tell us about that type of proceeding in a divorce called a, case. It's called a PDL, pendente lite. Um, uh, I know when I was going through Catholic school and I kept blowing off Latin because I didn't think I'd ever need it, that that was regrettable. Um, I did read Ovid and I did read Caesar's Gallic Wars. Omnius, Trace, no, Amnius, Amnius Gallius, Amnius Gallia, Trace Partes. All Gaul is divided into three parts. You now know my Latin. Kevin, that's it, we're I'm done. Um, and um, so it, it, PDL stands for uh, pendente lite, meaning money uh, during the pendency of the case. If you have a situation where the parties get separated and let's say mom is a stay-at-home mom, she needs some money from dad to pay the bills um, he may pay it directly. Um, he may think that that's sufficient. Um, oftentimes it is, and you don't need to do anything with the court. Oftentimes it's not, and you have to be representing the stay-at-home parent, or even the parent that is working, but is significantly lower in income than the other spouse. You have to get an allowance for, um, uh, to pay child support, or to pay maintenance, or for attorney's fees or for um, litigation expenses to like to hire an expert. So um, in the case I had was uh, my client wasn't working. It was, she, she was, God, she was probably, she seemed old at the time. Now she seemed pretty young <laughs> back then. She was probably 55 or six and hadn't worked out for quite a while. And if ever, he was making a pretty good income and he basically just was ignoring the expense of the house. And of course, once you get separated, you've now created two households. 
which means you've got two rents or two house payments, you've got two sets of utilities. So when you break up the house um, and you only have one spouse working, that dollar has to divide between two households. So everybody it becomes, uh, uh, everybody should suffer the same uh, detriment or receive the same benefit. And obviously if the marital residence is where the non-employee spouse is staying, there's equity in that asset that you want to preserve. So. As, as I rec remember the, the concept of PDLs, <clears throat> at least one aspect, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was to make sure that there was not some inequality of support while the case was pending so that somebody didn't have to take a whole lot less money ultimately because they needed it now. Uh, that's certainly part of it, which is to um, <clears throat> try and make sure that the assets are not diminished because of the spending to um, keep the house afloat or um, whatever. But the problem becomes uh, if both people are working, it's a little, a little less difficult. Um, but if there's only one spouse working, the dollar only goes so far, and oftentimes there has to be a, diminu a diminution of the property because that's the only way they can keep both places afloat. And you say, well, why do the people move out? Well, um, they don't have to at times, but it's, it's pretty tense living with somebody you don't want to be living with anymore. Um, <clears throat> people try and, it and then it doesn't quite work out. It does doesn't it? work out and as, um, what was it, um, uh, War of the Roses, I think. Uh, <clears throat> the movie? Yeah, with Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. I think they showed a pretty good example of what living together can be. Um, who, at who least to out? the extreme. Who moves out? I announce I, a divorce. But I'm staying. My wife says I'm staying too. Then you have a potential um, court appearance where one of them is asking the other one to move out, and the court has to make a decision. And the question becomes: Is what what reason is there to require one spouse to leave? Um, there's no domestic violence. They just don't like one another anymore. They don't love one another anymore. And they don't want to be married to one another anymore. Well. One of you is going to have to move at some point. <clears throat> now, what I tell people is, look, if you're going to fight over custody of your children, um, one of the best things you can do is separate and, and get to where you're going to be because I, if I don't know where you're going to be when I'm doing this divorce, it's very hard for me to determine what type of custody plan you should have um, uh, because even if you're both fighting to keep the house, one of you is going to have to go somewhere. And so if I've got to figure out a custody plan and I'm doing it in effect hypothetically, which is one of you moving out, but I don't know who and I don't know where, it makes it very difficult to do a custody plan. Um, if dad, if they live, the marital house is in Ladue and I say to dad, well, if you move out, are you going to stay in Ladue? Well, no, I'm going to go to Parkway. Okay, mom, if you move out, where are you going to go? Well, I'm going to go down to Melville well, where do these kids go to school? Um, if they're gonna sell the house in part of the divorce, <clears throat> it makes it, at least eliminates of my example of it's going to do, but they've still got Parkway and Melville. And so, um, obviously, if they can sell the house during the divorce, sometimes that's beneficial because they get everybody where they're supposed to be. It gets rid of a headache. Um, because then they've got to sell it, they've got to, uh, selling a house in a divorce, as part of a divorce decree or as part of a settlement is just the major, biggest pain in the neck. Um, I agree. It's, okay, what are you going to list it for? Who are you going to list it with? Um, when are you going to list it? Um, uh, what offers are you going to accept? When are you going to decide to reduce the price? Um, if there has to be work done on it, what, well, who's going to pay for the work? I mean, when is closing going to occur? It's like a constant headache. And so what I've told judges forever at, at um, the judicial college, don't ever order the house sold. You just created your own monster. But from a custody standpoint, um, if you don't know where they're going to be, it's very difficult to set up a custody plan. So keeping 
if the house is not going to be sold, they really ought to decide as best they can who's going to keep the house. Now, many times the, co the house is cost prohibitive. I mean, if, with two incomes, it's fine. <clears throat> but with one income, it won't work. Or it's the only real asset they have. The only asset that has any real equity in it that would create cash to facilitate them getting their new place, whether it's an apartment or a condo or, or whatever it is. So sometimes it has to be sold. But not knowing where they're going to be because they're both fighting about the house, particularly if, if it's clear one of them can't afford it, I, I would, during our conferences while the case is pending, what we call a status conference <clears> or <throat> case management conference, would be, what, do you understand? Can you really afford this house? And if you can't, maybe you ought to look now and help, that will help me figure out the custody plan. Like if you've got two kids and you've got a one-bedroom apartment, okay. You're probably not going to be the residential parent, but you're still going to have time with your kid or children, whatever. So, yeah, it's, the house is a problem uh, for multiple reasons. <coughs> now, you've mentioned a number of times the custody plan. Right. I presume, well, tell us about that. Well, it's called a parenting plan, which is who, it, it, it addresses two principal issues. Legal custody, which is the decision making, and physical custody, which is where are the kids. Legal custody, as I said, is decision making, medical, school, let's say private versus public, um, uh, activities at times, and religion. And the presumption now is joint legal, which means they have to agree. Um, so you're now telling two people who can't stay married that they're going to make decisions joint for their children. Many of them can. Many of them can focus on their kids. Many of them can't. Um, <clears throat> what is happening is that joint legal has become the it's my perception, the presumption that when the judge walks out on the bench, the presumption is he or she's going to give joint legal. And that therefore the parent that wants sole legal has the practical burden of convincing the judge it needs to be sole legal. Um, oftentimes they both ask for sole legal, which makes it pretty easy, because if they both think they can't agree, then probably they can't. But um, if one's asking for joint and the other's asking for sole, then the judge has to make that decision. And, and joint has its own problems, which is um, they can stone, somebody can stonewall. Um, school, um, the, the, if, if it's public, pretty much once you decide the physical plan, you're deciding who's the residential parent, so that decision is made. Um, medical, however, is an ongoing thing. Um, braces, uh, are they, medically required or are they cosmetic? Um, certain types of surgery or who's going to do the surgery? Where's the surgery going to be um, are recurring? Um, uh, when uh, even taking the child to urgent care because the child fell off the, the seesaw um, or, the, or the jungle gym, I think those two things still exist. Um, uh, do you have to get the permission of the other spouse or the other parent? So you, uh, joint legal ha has its own issues. On the other hand, it does insulate the children from one parent um, dominating all of the decisions and maybe making bad decisions. So legal custody is the decision making. <clears throat> um, so you cover, you try to cover all of those things in a court order. In a parenting plan. In a parenting plan. It's incorporated and adopted by the court in its dissolution judgment. Then you have physical custody, uh, which as a component of who's the residential parent, where's the child going to live for educational purposes? You know, what school districts the child going to go to? And what's happened is the school districts have now, many of them, and probably most if not all of them, have become wise because of all the, the efforts to get the kids in various school districts that they want to see the parenting plan to see where's the child living most of the time so that you can't have dad live in Ladue and he's only got every other weekend and mom live in the city um, and then say, well, we're, we're going to label dad the residential parent so the kids can go to Ladue. Okay, so <clears throat> schools have now looked at, no, 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 child's got to be living with you a certain amount of time. 
So, uh, so residential parent is the first piece. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the second is how much time does the child spend with each parent? And it's presumed that the order will be joint physical custody, which is presumptively 50-50. In terms of time. In terms of time. So if I'm making the decision, um, and I, I've broken it down into two things. Objective facts and subjective facts. The objective fact it would be if dad lives in Springfield, Missouri, and mom lives in St. Louis, they can't be 50-50 parents for their school-aged children. They can be 50-50 parents for their preschool children. So, but that's an objective fact. Dad lives in Springfield, mom lives here, and it's nothing to do with who's the better parent. Um, uh, the next object, in fact, dad starts work at uh, 9 a.m., mom starts work at 4 a.m., okay? And they're school-aged children. Mom, if mom doesn't have, even if mom does have a, somebody that could watch the children but doesn't live in the home, mom has to get up at 3 o'clock, and if she has to schlep the kids over to grandma, that means the kids are getting up at 3 a.m. Mom says, well, the, on my days, I will have the kids live, stay overnight at grandma. Okay, she solved an objective fact, but it's still an objective fact. It has nothing to do with who's the better parent or anything such as that. So those are two good examples of objective facts. Then you get into the subjective fact of um, who's, the, who's the parent, uh, who's, quote, the better parent, and what does better mean? Um, what, what depends on uh, the child, the child's age, um, child's gender, maybe. Um, uh, child may be closer to mom if it's a girl, especially if it's a teenage girl going through some of the issues that, that go into teenage, becoming a teenage uh, female. Um, uh, if it's a real athletic boy and dad's just a baseball nut, they may be closer because they follow the baseball universally. On the other hand, gender may be completely irrelevant and that mom may be the sports fanatic and it won't matter. So uh, you sort of look at things that are, that are somewhat subjective, um, and that's the hard part, is who's the better parent? And that's when you have to listen to all of the things mom has done, or dad has done, or not done, and mom has not done. What, it's been my experience in, the, in, the, in a divorce as opposed to a paternity case that marriages sort of take on their own life in terms of a division of labor. And it's oftentimes not the product of a discussion, it just sort of happens that one of the parents is the parent that takes the children to most of the medical appointments, that one of the parents is the one that gets up in, in, at night, not because the other one's unwilling, but um, that's who the kid wanted. My dad was a doctor, and when my sister and I were sick, we wanted mom. We just wanted mom. You know, mom was, she had medical training, but dad was an internationally recognized physician, but we wanted mom. You know, it's just the way it was. And we both, both, my sister and I were always asked for that, and as did my brother. Um, so there's, there's just the way you take on responsibilities in a marriage isn't necessarily the product of any specific choice, it just kind of happens. And oftentimes then that becomes fuel, if you will, at the time of the divorce, on why the other parent, who maybe who wasn't involved in the day in, day out caretaking, should have less time. Well, a lot of times that parent said, look, I would have done it, but we just kind of fell into this pattern. And it wasn't that I didn't want to be at the, at the, um, the kids' medical appointments, but I trusted her. But now I don't. So what, what is it she's done to, to um, earn your distrust? Well, you don't love her anymore. Well, that may be, but that doesn't mean her decision making is uh, bad or ever was bad. So it's, it, it's not as simple as, as, as you would think. Um, if it's a 50-50 plan, there's multiple ones out there. Um, a lot of times you do every other week, which I think is insanity. Um, Why? Uh, I'll get there. It's not as insane as every other day. 
Every other day is complete insanity. That means you, you'll start Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So if you're a kid, that means every other week you spend different days with dad and mom. Now that's got to be what? Why, why would it? Some people do it, and it works for some. I think it's nuts for kids. I never did that. I seldom did it every week, every other week during the school year. My plan that I thought then and still think now is the best interest of kids if you're going to do 50-50. Monday, Tuesday with one parent, Wednesday, Thursday with the other parent, and every other week. So it's a 2-2-5, 2-2-5-2-2. Two, two, five. Two, two, five, two, two. <coughs> so mom would have Monday, Tuesday, dad have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, will be his weekend, go back to mom, she gets Monday, Tuesday, dad gets Wednesday, Thursday, and mom gets the weekend into Monday, Tuesday. Why do I think that's best? One, it, yeah, it's not as big a gap in time between each parent is week in, week out. Two, if you want to put your kid in an activity that occurs only on your day, you don't really need the permission of the other parent from a transportation standpoint to participate. So if you want to put your kid in, in jujitsu and Monday and Tuesday are your days and it's only on Monday, you may need to get dad's permission to pay some of the cost, but you need, don't need dad's permission to schlep him back and forth. Piano lessons. If they're going to be done at your house, you don't have to get dad to schlep the kid over to mom's house or mom to schlep the kid over to dad's house. So from that standpoint, it removed that problem. It also was predictable. The kid always knew Monday, Monday night I get picked up by mom, Tuesday night I get picked up by mom, mom takes me to school on Wednesday, dad picks me up on Wednesday. So it's predictable to the kid. Yes, every other Monday, the kid, or every other Sunday night, whatever, whenever the kid got exchanged, uh, kid had to have all his homework done and had to get all his school books together, either A, to, for the other parent to pick up or to, to take to school. So there's some problem. Uh, they still have to transfer um, the soccer equipment, the baseball equipment, but, you know, that's part and parcel of any package, of any custody plan. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I've, I've Still think the two two five five two is the best plan for kids if you're going to do 50-50 during the school year. Summer, I, th I think every other week is the best plan um, because um, most camps uh, are week-long camps. Uh, you have to pay for a minimum of three days. So if it's your only your two-day week, um, if you have Monday and Tuesday and it's the other parents' weekend, how do you get that done? It may not work. Secondly, if you want to send them to an away camp, you send them away for the week. Um, and uh, I just think week in, week out during the summer works better for families. They can take vacation. They're going to take vacations anyway. Um, and this gives them seven days minimum. Sometimes you can do ten days. But if you keep the two to five during the summer, and you gerrymander it the way you, you can, you get 14 days, which is probably a little too long with no, no contact with your parent. What about holidays? Uh, basically every other holiday. Um, the, the, the funny thing is, um, uh, we all think as adults that these holidays are really important. Oh, Memorial Day, Labor Day. The kids care about two, maybe three days. Two days. Christmas, maybe th four days. Christmas and Christmas Eve or two, I'll take those two separate days. Their birthday and maybe Halloween. Other than that, they could care less. It's, every, it's like every other day. Okay, maybe a day I don't have to go to school, or if it's a summer day, it's like I was in the school anyway. So, so, but, so basically, we, we alternate the three-day weekends. Um, uh, I never knew Halloween was a holiday, but to some parents it is. And it becomes a big deal. Um, if you're doing a, a two two five five two, um, every Halloween moves. I realize, but it's only one of every seven days. And depending on how it rotates, you're going to get it probably. You're going to get at least three out of every seven days. 
and over road, over a Soviet seven year rotation. So, um, but I, but yes, yeah, some people fight over it. Um, <clears throat> July Fourth can become an issue. Um, sometimes they fight over the parents' birthdays. Um, uh, um, but the, the the primary holiday that has to really be the two of them. One is Thanksgiving. Do you give the whole weekend all the way through, or do you just give Wednesday and Thursday, and then whoever's weekend it is? And if you get Thanksgiving and it's your weekend, then you got the whole thing. If it's not your weekend, then you just get the Wednesday, Thursday, into Friday afternoon. Um, um, if Christmas. You see, if you see one of those every other day in a parenting plan presented by the parties. Would you, as a judge, alter it or not approve it? No, if they, if that's their, if that's what they think is best for their children. I'm not gonna. I, my job isn't to interfere with their judgment, in my opinion. My job is to exercise judgment when they can't. So let me finish with Christmas. Um, that's. I've always felt there's a, the, the most important piece to Christmas. With all due respect, Kevin, to the religious piece. Um, is whose house they wake up in, okay? Um, because there's services on Christmas Eve, there's services later on Christmas morning. If, uh, and, but especially with the younger kids, where are they gonna wake up? And so I always, I always broke Christmas, the Christmas vacation down at noon on Christmas Day. So that every other year they would wake up in one parent's household, they would spend Christmas Eve, with one family, wake up at that family's house, go to the other family at noon, and then the next year they reverse it. There's multiple, multiple variations and gyrations to this that people do. Um, but that's how I did Christmas. I thought that was the best way to do it. Can, can a child just arbitrarily and unilaterally change the parenting plan? say, I'm 15 years old, I don't want to leave at noon on Christmas. I'd rather just stay here with mom. Well, can they, to answer your question, can they unilaterally change the parenting plan? The answer to that is no. Can they practically uh, prevent the implementation of the parenting plan? The answer is yes. Uh, by refusing to go and having a parent that will endorse their refusal to go. Um, and um, this is becoming a constant, I shouldn't constant, becoming a common problem with these teenage kids. They just don't want to go. Um, and sometimes I get why they don't, um, but most times it's just because they're teenage and ordinary, and they get what they want in one house and they don't in the other. Um, some houses have more strict rules than others. Doesn't mean, I'm not saying they're lenient, but you know, maybe one house allows you to get to school night to go to bed at 10.30 and the other house says nine o'clock and you're 15. Better example, one house makes you turn in your cell phone when you go to bed, the other house doesn't. Um, and so yeah, they, it becomes a constant problem and the question is what do you do about it? It's a system and the system is ill-equipped. If, maybe not even ill-equipped, it's unequipped, probably is a better way, to enforce that, that problem, or to, you know, enforce, to solve that problem and enforce the quarter. And so you do the best you can. Tom, speaking of doing the best you can, are you doing some special work with respect to visitation issues and custody issues? Yeah, there's a, there's a legislator, a legislative, legislature created what's called a parent coordinator. There's some question about how much authority the person really has, but for right now, there's no real answer from the, from the appellate courts, at least that I'm aware of. And what the parent coordinator is, is an effort to try and keep people out of court. <clears throat> there's one of me, and instead of two lawyers and a guardian in line, it gets back to something we talked about um, or, uh, in the previous session about trying to keep costs down for people. Um, <clears throat> and so they come to me with a problem, and I try and resolve it for them by issuing a ruling. Uh, although I first thing try, the first thing I try and do is really mediate, have them come to their own recognition of 
what's the best solution to the problem. And um, uh, so I'll meet with them um, in person, try and mediate a resolution. And in the absence of uh, mediated resolution, I'll issue a ruling that says this is what you got to do. So far, I've been pretty successful in having them understand the complications of, of their uh, problem and try and getting them to come to recognition of um, the, the best way to solve the problem. Uh, but not always. A lot of times it's telling dad, look, I'm just not going to support you on that. Or mom, you know, you're being a little too rigid on this. You really need to back off. So some of my conversations are individually with the mom or with the dad um, to try and tell them, look, I'm just not with you on this one. Um, uh, most of it's together to try and have them understand the reason why the other parent is doing what they're doing. Um, can they buy some, you on the weekend? Can they buy you after hours? What? Can they? Or I do guess. They? Do they? Yes. Um, uh, most of them I, I have found to be pretty good about that, to be blunt about it. Um, uh, a lot of it's done by email, so a lot of it has to do with the ability, my ability to respond, or inability as it may be. Um, but I, uh, I, I gotta say, most of them have been resp that have my cell phone, and a lot of them do, maybe all of them, I don't know, um, have respected that. I, I, I have to say that uh, I'm really, um, that's been really good. I've not been um, hounded on the weekend with stuff that I couldn't solve. Um, but. I think it has a very good, it's a good way, um, <coughs> excuse me, to try and keep them out of court if they'll listen. Um, because I can say, look, I can tell you what I would do with this. I mean, I'm not Judge A, I'm not Judge B, I don't know what they're going to do. Although some of them I do know well enough that I know what they'll tolerate and what they won't. But you're going to get your butt handed to you, okay? It's going to cost you a lot of money and you're going to lose. Um, and so I've been able to, in most cases, to have them back off and say, okay, I get it. How, we, how do we solve this problem? I think this is what you got to do. I think, I think mom's right on this one. You just got to give in. Um, or vice versa, dad. Mom, you, you know, he's, he's right. You need to listen to him. So, um, but how do you make the kid go is an impossible problem to solve. Um, um, I, I had it on the bench, and if I thought mom was the cause of it, um, I stopped the child support. Um, got affirmed once, got reversed once. What do you um, mean by that? In the Court of Appeals? Yeah, once, uh, got affirmed in the Court of Appeals once and reversed. Um, <clears throat> and the one I got, and I got reversed because <clears throat> uh, I said, well, Dad, you have to pay for college. She doesn't want to go see him. I'm not gonna make you pay for college. I got reversed, fast forward. Um, Dad, to his credit, stayed involved, kept pushing to have time. And the young lady finally figured out that mom was the problem and ended up living with Dad, as did her two sisters. So, so she was older. Well, they were all three of them were older, um, but they she was a teenager and I. Her reasons for not seeing dad were um, what happens, unfortunately, all too often. One, uh, dad had remarried, and um, she was angry at dad for that. Um, and mom had um, poisoned the well and told, mom, told, dad, told the kid a lot of things about dad that were untrue and a lot of things about um, New life, no untrue. And the young lady, um, to her credit, um, and I gave her a lot of credit, um, matured and kept an eye. And as she matured, processed what she was told versus what she saw, and realized that what she was told was not what she saw, and and did what was best for her which was to distance herself from the mother and to um, reconnect with dad. But to dad's credit, dad didn't just say sayonara. He kept the channel of communication open. I give him a lot of credit for that. And 
also his, uh, his new wife, uh, um, and that she stayed the course also. Pretty easy to just say, see you later, and didn't. So they, they both deserve a lot of credit. But it's hard. It, it's, the system is just not suited. And if you have a parent that supports the kid not going, it's awful. I had one in the, the court where the kid was, I don't know, about eight or nine, you know, probably 10, and had no interest in going to dad. We were in court. The kid was there. I said, well, <clears throat> so far, there's a young lady. The reasons you've given me make no sense to me uh, in terms of there's no abuse. There's no um, a reason you shouldn't go. You're here now. You're going to leave tonight with your father. Otherwise, you're going to spend the night in juvenile court. Mom said to the girl, spend a night in juvenile court. Don't go with your father. Now, how do you combat that? Well, that's telling in and of itself. Yeah, yes, yes. And dad took the young lady. It was, it was awful. Um, and finally, it became clear he couldn't combat mom. And he I took a very minimal amount of custody as part of the, the divorce. And I don't know, frankly. Actually, I think they were divorced. He just stopped enforcing the order and told the young lady, when you're ready, I'm here. Now, it's, it's, it, it's awful. This, the, this part of it is absolutely uh, gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, because uh, there's no solution. And if you've got a parent that's um, unwilling to push the kid out the door, what does the other parent do? You bring the police. Well, the police are very uncomfortable getting in the middle of a domestic dispute. And you got a court order, and what are they gonna do, put the kid in the car? And then, it, it's, there's just, it's awful. I, I feel being repetitive, it's just. At what age does the law start respecting input from a child with respect stop to Stop or custody? start? Start. Um, Really, any well, almost any age it starts. In other words, if you're in a, if you're in a divorce case, a case or a paternity case, um, um, the child is particularly paternity case is a party, but the, the child has a has an interest, if you will, in the custody plan. So the question becomes: At what age do you, as a judge, <coughs> think this child is old enough to testify? John can testify to two things: one, facts; two, opinion. Where the child wants to live would be opinion. Um, the example I gave uh, about mom having a boyfriend and then and the, the, the boyfriend spending the night that would be a fact. So, <clears throat> in case law is pretty clear that they can testify to facts at an earlier age than they can testify to an opinion. Um, I seldom had a case where I didn't talk to the kids. I didn't offer to talk to the kids. And the lawyers will, oh, judge, that puts the kids in the middle. Tom, one thing I wanted to cover, because we're close to running out of time, and that is the role of grandparents legally with respect to seeing their grandchildren and related issues. What, what does the law provide? Grandparents, uh, there's a statute. They have statutory rights to visitation. Um, you can uh, get visitation under three sets of facts, basically. One, that um, the parents are divorced, or you are the grandparents of either the mom or the dad. You cannot get visitation if your kid is married and he or she says no rights. If they're married, you cannot file for visitation rights even though you think it's unfair that your child is depriving you. The other situation is um, <clears throat> that might apply uh, is if the child has lived with you for more than six months, okay? Uh, the law used to be you could file for, for visitation um, if all you were proving is in the best interest of the child to have time with you. That is no longer the case. It's been that way for about three or four years. So you must have one of the three grounds. One is that there's a divorce. Two is the child's lived with you. I think it's for continuous six months. And there's a third basis, which I don't remember what it is, but doesn't apply in, in, in most instances. And that it's in the best interest of the child, that the child have visitation rights with you. Um, you can get visitation only 
and it cannot be very extensive. Um, it might be maybe one weekend a month, maybe one, uh, maybe a week in the summer, might even not be that much. So it's limited to uh, special circumstances and it's very restrictive in time. If your child is divorced, you have the right to file you know, on your own or through a lawyer a motion for visitation rights as a motion to modify in the divorce proceeding. If it's a situation where the child has lived with you, um, that would be the filing of a separate proceeding um, for visitation rights. Can you do it on your own? You can. Should you file these on, on your own? Probably not. You should hire a lawyer to have him or her um, initiate the, the proceeding for you. So. Um, for those parents, or for those grandparents who feel they're being deprived of time with their grandchild because of the new spouse and that your child who's still married to that new spouse won't allow you time, you're just out of luck under the statute less, as it currently exists. In, in less than a minute, we forgot to talk about child support. There's a form 14, it's calculated um, mathematically. Uh, I can talk about the form 14 and how it was uh, created. I was part of the committee that did it. Uh, that's probably 30 minutes. Well, I but don't it's, think we um, have time to do that. It's got its own nuances to it. Um, and clearly, people have an obligation to pay child support legally. And correct, and it's, and it's enforceable by contempt. Um, but again, uh, if you lock them up, um, they can't work. Although when I, I, had a, I used to do a Christmas, I used to do a child support collection document on Christmas Eve. Um, it generated a lot of money for the, for the kids for Christmas Day. And a lot of these guys would say, well, you know, it was mostly guys that weren't paying. I had some mothers that weren't paying also. But so most of the non-payer would say, well, if I'm locked up, she's not going to get any money. And they say, well, she's not getting anything now. So she's no worse off. You are. Or he's no worse off. You are. But at some point, um, you've got to let them out. And Right now, one of the other impediments is that uh, they lose their driver's license if they get too far behind. And out state, there's no mass transit. So a guy with no driver's license has to, or a gal with no driver's license has difficulty um, finding a job. And so you've just created your own cycle of, that can't be broken. So it's, it's, it's a real problem, the whole child support. But you know, we talked about, you know, there's an issue of emancipation. When does child support stop? college obligations. Folks, this is, uh, I know Richard thinks it's, he thinks it's like, like a gall. It's only divided into three parts. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not. I'm it's convinced a, that you're right. Thank you, Tom. My pleasure. For the, uh, the privilege of hearing you speak. On behalf of the citizens of the state of Missouri, let me also say thank you for all you've done as a judge and for all you're doing now, too. It's uh, unbelievably important. I've been, and we're grateful. I've been incredibly blessed by the Lord in that. Um, supposed to be a doctor, messed that up first year of college. Took the law boards because my three roommates were doing it. And I found something that I really enjoy and uh, I think I'm pretty good at. So I've been pretty blessed. Pretty blessed. And I had a pretty good roommate in law school by Richard. I won't respond to that, but again, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, grateful for all you've done. Take care. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us.